Today, I want to invite you into my living room, and, and I thought that what we are going to discuss, this would just be a good setting for us to have this conversation. You know, depending on your view of what has transpired in the last several months uh, with COVID-19 has a lot to do with how much this has affected you. If you have underlying health conditions, for instance, you probably have been way more cautious than if you didn't. If you're caring for somebody that has underlying health conditions or just under that guidelines of the most vulnerable, you probably have been more cautious about uh, being out and about. You know, the more concerned you are, the more cautious you have been. The more cautious you have been, the more withdrawn you have been from society. The more withdrawn you have been from society has a lot to do with how much this has affected you. And for many people in the world, it has brought a lot of discouragement, even sense of depression and loneliness in our world. I read an article the other day, and this is what it said. Feeling of discouragement and fear are starting to spike again now that parts of America have reopened. These feelings are completely normal, even if it seems like other people think you're overreacting. So there's these feelings that a lot of people are dealing with. And that's the topic that I wanted to talk to you about today, discouragement. You know, maybe it is something related to COVID-19. Maybe some of you are just feeling discouraged or depressed or lonely. Uh, that's not really related to COVID-19. Maybe it's because of a sickness. Maybe during this time you had somebody that you're very fond of, very close to pass away. Maybe job loss. Maybe relationship, whether it's with a girlfriend, a spouse, or a child, or maybe you're just feeling lonely. You know, it, it could be perhaps that even you're having these feelings of discouragement or, or loneliness, uh, and you really don't even know how to put your finger on it. Like, it's just there. Logically, you know that it shouldn't be, but mentally it's just hard for you to snap out of it. Today, I want us to look at the life of Elijah. And my prayer is that as we look into his life and into these scriptures, that it will encourage you. And if you're feeling discouraged, that you just have this sense of hope, knowing that you're not alone. One of the greatest prophets of all time have that feeling of discouragement and depression as well. And also that you find, just as he did, relief and strength to just continue to move on. Also, I kind of like to address those of you that haven't had any bouts of discouragement or loneliness through this. I want to encourage you that there's something here in God's Word for you as well. I think that God would like for you to see that there are people around you that He really wants to use you as His servant to minister to these people, to have compassion and, and be gentle and encourage them, to minister to them as God sent His angels to minister to Elijah that we will see here in a second. You know, the story demonstrates that anybody can fall into a time of discouragement or loneliness. I think mistakenly, we think that you, 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 it's a sense of, of weakness in our faith if we get discouraged. But, you know, I just don't think that that's true. In fact, many of the, the, the strongest people of faith in the Word of God have had moments that they had to battle with discouragement, loneliness, even sense of depression. Just think of Job for a minute and how discouraged he was. Think of Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it tells us that he was sweating drops of blood because he had such discouragement going on. Paul, in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he was uh, fighting this, this um, uh, battle in his flesh, you know, the, the thorn in the flesh, he called it, and how discouraged he was for quite some time until he got it figured out. Or even David, and he wrote all these psalms of times that he felt discouraged and lonely. You know, in fact, it'd be a lot easier coming up with a list, of, at least if you want a short list, of somebody that didn't struggle with these kinds of feelings. But it does surprise me, as we look into Elijah, it surprises me that he would fall so quickly and, and so deep into discouragement. Many commentators say that he not only was discouraged, he was severely depressed. This was a man who seemed to take on every challenge that came his way. 
I mean, no matter what the enemy was, no matter what the challenge was, he just had this confidence and, and courage and uh, power about him. And yet he fell into discouragement. Surely a man who walked so closely with God and was used so powerfully wouldn't battle with this, you think? But that's just not true. He did. In fact, in the chapter 18, the, the, the chapter just before this, one of my favorite stories takes place. Here you have Elijah going up against uh, 450 uh, Baal prophets, you know, uh, people who were following a false god on Mount Carmel. And there was this contest. And there was this altar that they created, and they, they put a sacrifice on this altar. And, and Elijah let them go first, and they were supposed to, you know, pray and cry down that uh, uh, God would, uh, their God would consume the altar. And they prayed for hours and hours and hours, and Elijah was making fun of him. Maybe your God is asleep, or he's on a little journey or something. And he was making fun of him. When it come Elijah's turn, he had buckets and buckets, gallons and gallons of water dumped upon this altar, upon the sacrifice around the trenches. It was just running everywhere. And then he prayed to his God, and God sent this consuming fire out of heaven and just consume the whole thing. I mean, it, what an amazing thing it would have been to be there. And Elijah was at the head of all of that. You know, he was God's right-hand man. The adrenaline that must have come out of Elijah through that time. It tells us that, that, they, they, that a, a, a man was sent to Jezreel, to Jezebel, to report what the, just happened. And that Elijah pulled up his, his uh, um, cloak or whatever, and, and he took off running. He outran the chariot before he even got there. That's how much adrenaline, I guess, or just how powerful God was in this man. And yet, just a few verses later, after all that transpired there at Jezreel, and, and Jezebel was out to seek to kill him, even in the midst of this, instead of bound to God, we come to verse 4, and look what it says here. Look how drastically these things change. He says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he, may, he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he laid down and slept under a broom tree. Elijah had such the blues. I mean, he was so discouraged at this time, feeling all alone. It tells us on in verse 9 a little bit more insight into why he was feeling this way. Verse 9, it says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel had forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You know, Cheryl Crow said recently that in an interview, she says, I am an extrovert, and self-containing is really hard for me. It, Lori uh, Ferguson, who is a, has her PhD in psychi psychiatrist and a psychiatrist, said this: "As human beings, we are not wired to be all by ourselves. We are beings that need contact. So finding ways to connect with people, even if you're not physically connecting with them, is really important." This is what Elijah was dealing with. He was feeling all alone, and loneliness just isn't. In, is good for us. Katie Willard said, another psychiatrist said, social isolation and loneliness can lead to other health concerns also. We know there's a big link between loneliness and depression. So first we see that what created Elijah getting so discouraged so quickly is that he was feeling all alone. I think also, not only was he feeling all alone, but he was also feeling like he was a failure, like he, he didn't succeed. I think we all know how discouraging it can be in life when you feel like that you 
have failed at something, whether you failed at work or, or at school or, you know, in relationships, parenting, whatever it would be, on and on. But when you feel like you have really failed at something, discouragement and even sense of depression uh, can creep in. And Elijah was feeling that, so he was feeling alone. He was feeling like he was a failure. In fact, the scripture points that out. Not only was he feeling alone, but in verse 4, remember, it says that um, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life that I am no better than my father's. I've not accomplished anything anybody else has done. I can't seem to turn these people. And so he felt like a failure. There's a third reason for his blues, I think. Not only was he alone, not only he felt like a failure, but also he was just trying to survive. He was afraid of dying and suffering by the hands of Jezreel, which is really at the core, I think, of us staying at home during this time. Why we have isolated ourselves so deeply for a lot of us is because there's just this fear that, you know, of death that we have to try to protect. This is actually also one of the reasons that Jesus was struggling in the Garden of Gethsemane, wasn't he? Sweating drops of blood, and what did he say? If this cup can be taken from me, Lord, please let it. And maybe it wasn't so much the dying, maybe it was more of the suffering or the separation that he knew he was going to have to feel between him and his father. But that is what led to the discouragement in uh, Elijah. The next section that I want to point out, not only what led to his discouragement, but also I want you to see how God cared for Elijah during this time of rest and reflection because there was a period of time before God steps in, before he personally comes and helps Elijah, there was a period of time. And this is what it says to us during that time in verse 7 through, uh, or 5 through 7. It says to us, and he, he laid down and slept under the room tree, and behold, angels touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there, there was at his head a cake of, of baked, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. For the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that forty f- food 40 days and 40 nights to Hebron, the Mount of God. May- maybe you haven't dealt with discouragement. Maybe you haven't dealt with it, but I bet that you know somebody in your circle, in your close contact that is probably discouraged in the midst of this either from COVID or just something else that's going on in life. And God used, I want you to see this, but God used angels to come and minister to Elijah for a period of time. Not to be his spokesman. These angels weren't to come and straighten him out to to speak to him. God was going to do that himself. He just wanted them to come as his servants to care for him, to comfort him, to, to nourish him. He... I want you to know this, that not only are angels, you know, ministering spirits sent here to minister to us, but we ourselves are servants of God. And a part of our job is to minister to the people around us. He wants to send you, if you're not dealing with this, he wants, to be, he wants you to be somebody that he does send to people who are discouraged and just nurture them and, and, and comfort them and strengthen them until he arrives on the scene. In fact, he would probably, if you say anything, he just wants you to encourage them to go to him. You see, this is what 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says to us. It says, For God hath not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. You see, he's writing to this, helping us understand that Jesus is going to be coming and, and, and God is going to be coming for his people and everything will be taken care of at that time. But until then, he wants us to encourage one another, to build one another up and be this, this 
um, time, I mean this agent of God's to help those who are discouraged. You know, my mom and my brother, they have all suffered from bouts of anxiety uh, periodically through life. And sometimes it's pretty uh, disabilitating to them. And I, for the longest time, didn't really understand. I just had this mindset that, you know, why don't you just choose to be happy? Why don't you just choose to be positive? Why don't you just kind of snap out of this? And then a few years uh, back, I had my own bouts of anxiety, panic attacks that came my way. And let me tell you something, never would I ever tell somebody to snap out of it again. In fact, I would rather just go to them and show compassion and try to encourage them and try to just be that angel in their life until God comes and speaks into their life. You see, our job is to be like that, to love, encourage, provide, uh, you know, just help them listen to God. You know, just realize that God's going to show up. He's going to speak to them and help them through this, just like he does for Elijah. So be an angel to someone is what I'm really saying. We have seen what caused Elijah's depression. He was lonely. He felt like a failure. He was trying to just not suffer and and not um, succumb to death. We also seen that the angels were sent and how God wants us to be that angel to other people. The last thing I want you to see here is how God led him up out of this discouragement. How he led him up out of this depression and helped him move on. It is found in verses 8 and 9, if you want to see this. So in verse 8 it says, And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of of that forty food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, the overarching thing that happens here, the takeaway, is that God shows up. But how is it that God shows up? You know, the way that God shows up is very similar to the way that God shows up for us today. Basically, what what God does is God takes Elijah to church. You know, the church provides so many things. In fact, the exact same things that God provides for Elijah here, the church provides each week for us. I want us to look at the parallel here. What does the church provide? The first thing the church provides is it provides an encounter with God. Just as Elijah had with God. God takes him up on the hill, and then God shows up and starts having a conversation with Elijah. God revealed himself. He always does. You know, so the first thing I want to say is just hang in there in the midst of your discouragement. Continue to let God lead you to the church. So here's what happened when God shows up. He took Elijah to church. Church provides at least these three things. An encounter with God. You know, during the the first part of the 20th century, there was a man named J.C. Penney. He was a real man who provided, you know, uh, he had an empire of of 1,700 stores. And at the time, it was the largest chain of ever. Um, During the Depression, he had such a setback that really almost cost him his life. And so in 1929, J.C. Penney had borrowed a lot of money to try to keep his stores moving forward. Then the Depression came. And during the Depression, he was, he was over-borrowed, and he couldn't pay his, you know, his uh, lenders back to the money. And it began to just weigh extremely heavy on him. He went into this, this, this like discouragement, and this is what he said. He says, I was so harassed with worries that I couldn't sleep and developed an extremely painful ailment. Concerned about, you know, the deterioration of his health, he checked himself into the Kellogg Sanitarium uh, at Battle Creek, Michigan. It was kind of like the Mayo Clinic at the time. And there was a doctor there, Dr. Eggleston, who was caring for him during this time, and he said he was this extremely ill. And Penny later recalls a rigid treatment was prescribed, but just nothing that he did helped. 
And so he was constantly just being tormented during this time. He, he just quickly saw himself eroding away into more despair. He said these words. He says, I got weaker day by day. I was broken, nervously and physically filled with despair, unable to see even a ray of hope. I had nothing to live for. I felt that I had not a friend in the world. Even my family felt like they were turning against me. And alarmed by this, the doctor began to prescribe him a sedative to try to calm him down. And it just didn't seem to help. When the sedative wore off one day, he got so discouraged, he thought that he was looking into the end of his life like today was the day. So he got up out of bed and he began to write his farewell letters, you know, to his wife and his son, saying that he doesn't expect to even see the dawn. Penny awakened the next morning, surprised that he even survived through the night. He got up out of his bed and he began to walk down the hall, just feeling this weight of hopelessness. And he remembers hearing people singing. It was a hymn that they were singing. And it just led him. He just kept following those voices. And he was listening to what they were saying. And this is what he said. Suddenly, something happened, he said. I can't explain it. I can only call it a miracle. I felt as if I had been instantly lifted out of darkness of a dungeon into a warm, uh, brilliant sunlight. I felt as if I had been transformed from hell to paradise. I felt the power of God as I had never felt before. So in this life-transforming instance where J.C. Penney's Penny met God, this encounter with God. He says these words in closing. He says, from that day to this, my life has been free of worry. You know, J.C. Penny was somewhere in his 40s during that time. He lived to be 95 years old. And so the latter half of his life, he spent with no worries whatsoever. Why? Because he had an encounter with God. First Kings chapter 19 verse 9 again it says then he came to a cave and lodged in it and behold the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him what are you doing here Elijah and God reinforced not only um, uh, his presence but secondly he reinforced his purpose you see that's the second thing about the church is that not only do you have this encounter with God when you go to church and like he had up on that mountain, but also God reinforced his purpose. He kept asking him, Elijah, why are you doing here? He says that in verse 9. Down in verse 13, he says it again. Elijah, what are you doing here? And then in verse 15, he says this to Elijah. He says, and the Lord said to him, go and return on your your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king o- over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahala, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You see, what's going on here is all of a sudden God is saying, you know, Elijah twice, Elijah, what are you doing here? Like, reflect on what I've called you to do, Elijah. And then he gives him these marching orders, what he is supposed to do. Go anoint these people. You know, church does that. When you come together as a church, you get the same thing. Not only you get the encounter with God, but you also get this reminder that God has given you a mission, a purpose in life. And for you to, to just be thinking about, why are you here on this earth? You know, the third thing that we see here, that the church does is it provides a fellowship of others. You know, uh, um, we all need, we've already discussed this, but we all need each other. You cannot 
live by yourself and not be discouraged or depressed. We have to have this fellowship with one another. You know, Elijah felt definitely all alone. In, in verse 10, it says, he says, I have been very jealous for the Lord and the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. See, Elijah was feeling all alone like he was the only one left. There is nobody like him, and no wonder he got so discouraged. But the reality is, and what God was pointing out through the, the latter part of those scriptures, is that you're not alone, Elijah. There's people I want you to go anoint. There's people that I want you to, to see that is, I'm rising up to, to take your place. There, I am, I'm not done here. I'm not done with you. I'm not done with things. And, and for Elijah to realize there was others out there, that there's still fellowship within God's kingdom. The last thing I want to leave you with before we dismiss uh, today is just this last thought. Be careful who you listen to. You know, when you were at church, you had this encounter with God. He reminds you of your purpose and you have fellowship with other believers who are going to be like-minded in that. When you leave the church, you've got to be careful who you listen to. When Elijah comes down off that mountain, he has to be careful who he listens to. He doesn't want to be listened to Jezebel anymore. That's what threw him into depression in the first place. He needs to listen to uh, uh, God. You know, God had him up on this mountain and God spoke to him. But I want you to see how God spoke to him because God did not speak to him in the chaos. In verse 11, it says this. And he says, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore through the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the, the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his faith in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, I just find that so fascinating that he spoke to him in this whisper. He didn't speak to him in the chaos. The same thing, I think, needs to be spoken to us and, re and help us remember that be careful who you are listening to. You know, minimize the news feeds in your life. Let me tell you, they will just lead into you more discouragement and even lead to depression. Just like they're like the Jezebels of our world, always telling us a bunch of lies and telling us a bunch of discouraging facts. Be careful about just your screen time. You know, I, even for you younger people, just being careful about your video time uh, or social media time. You see, all of those are, are things that Satan would love to use to try to draw you away from having this encounter with God. Be careful who speaks into your life. When, when, when Elijah wasn't careful about that, he let Jezebel speak into his life, and all of a sudden he was driven into despair. And, and also be careful who you, that you don't stop listening to God in the midst of this. It takes discipline, true discipline, to continue to listen to God, true effort to listen to God. You know, it's easy to hear God at the beginning of, of trouble, right? We've talked about this, just like in 9-11 when trouble came, instantly everybody, it seemed like Christians come out of the woodwork, listening to God, turning to God, uh, wanting God to be in the midst of that. But when it seemed like the, 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 the worry was all over, we quickly went back. You know, that's one of the worries I think most of all of us preachers uh, have had is just that when, when this subsides, does that mean that people will just, you know, start finding other things to listen to, find other things to participate in? You know, I had a meeting this past week with MOCAN, which were, it's the organization that, that is starting churches around our area. This is the church that we started in Winfield, Kansas. Uh, 
And, and the minister was just kind of reporting how things were going. And, you know, before any of this COVID thing happened, they were, they were already reaching up into the 70s, which is just extremely exciting. But just like us, they had to go to this online church. And, and he was just reporting that a lot of people were starting to disconnect. At first, they were in the hundreds of people who were viewing. And now they're like last Sunday, they were like 19, 20 people. You know, I have found that, not to that extreme, but I have found the same to be even with us, and I think most people have, that we've done this for so long, and it's gotten warm out, and, it, and there's just so many other things to draw our attention. And it takes effort to make sure that God has our attention, that we continue to let Him speak into our lives. You know, Satan will do and use anything to disconnect you from the church. If he can disconnect you from the church, he can, he can accomplish his ultimate goal, and that is to slowly disconnect you from him. Community matters. So whether you are worshiping with us online still today, or whether you're starting to move back into our building, I just highly encourage you to stay plugged in. Uh, that is where you have the encounter with God. That is where you find your purpose. That is where you, you know, find your fellowship. That is how you get out of your discouragement, out of your loneliness. Church matters. It is a place that God meets you face to face. And that's what we all need in order for us to continue to be encouraged. 